Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for lecture number eight. We are still on chapter two, page 20, if you, you are following along with this edition. Just a quick recap, Mr. Spencer, where we last left off, Mr. Spencer told Holden that he will have concerns for his future when it is too late. So we are just going to pick it up, page 20. I'd like to put some sense in the head of yours, boy. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you if I can. So perhaps he is trying to help in his own misguided way. I think he's not doing a great job, obviously, in helping Holden, but perhaps a part of him in his heart is, is trying to do the right thing and believes he really is helping and wants to do that. But like I mentioned before, we have multiple sides of ourselves. And if you don't know, if you don't know yourself, then you really don't know where you're being guided, who's guiding you, and what is guiding you. And I think the more powerful driving force here is really coming from a place not of wanting to assist and help, but wanting to damage and hurt and destroy. It's coming from a place of malice and spite, not a place of this like nurturing, kind mentor. That's not to say that that part doesn't exist in him. We have, we're, we can hold opposition within us. We can be, you know, paradoxes. We can be contradicting hypocritical, and even just our opinions about certain things, we can hold conflicting opinions simultaneously. And therefore, you can have two different motivating drives, but one is just far more powerful. And if you're not aware of this other drive that's more, let's say, nefarious, then that drive is going to become far more powerful and control you because you're just completely unaware of it, correct? versus the other one you just want to pay attention to and you want to cling to that one and think this is these motives are pure and they're really not they're getting tainted by this other source that you're not even realizing it it's as it's as if you're drinking from like a water fountain or a spring water and you're thinking you're just getting clean water and there's like uh an industrial building that's polluting the water supply and you're just drinking this poison and you're not realizing it you're thinking like oh no no i only see this spring coming from the mountain and you refuse to look at the, pol the pollutants. <laughs> and this is happening within Mr. Spencer and it happens in all of us. Uh, definitely at some part of your life, we've all done this where we thought in our minds that we're doing the right thing, that we're coming from a place of pure. Uh, we have pure and good intentions and that's it. There's no other way, there's no other bad intentions that are coming from here. And that's not true. Even things of like, charity sometimes people want to think that that's always pure but there's also those those other desires which is to have like self-glorification you want to appear superior you want to show off and brag to other individuals that you're doing these great things for people that are that need help and also it gives you a feeling of superiority not only to your peers but to those people that you're helping because you you there's a lot of individuals that want to do charity work and they like the idea that they're like this Mother Teresa figure, but deep down they also really feel superior to these people that they're helping. They want to find people that are helpless, they want them to be needy, they want to feel like, oh, I'm this this superhero that's coming to save you. I'm your you know, save I'm your savior. And it it's really belittling these individuals and they feel like they, they're helpless and they want to find these people to be they want them to be helpless. And I'm sure you could probably find examples of that. It's it's as if these people didn't need their help, they'd be upset with them and they're, they're trying to convince them like, no, 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 you need me, you need me. Because once again, human beings love to feel superior to one another. Even if it, one can try to convince themselves that they're just being these angels that are doing nothing but helping these poor, helpless people. And just in that, by saying that, you are automatically demeaning these people, calling them helpless and feeling that feeling like they require your assistance, your help, that they can't do it themselves. But back to this passage here, he he does seem like he's he maybe wants to help and whatnot, but he's not, his strategies are very, are very poor. They are misguided. They are having the opposite in, intended effect that he believes he's trying to have. Like he's trying to, put sense in his head. He's trying to help him and he says he's trying to help him twice. And if he can, right? Like if I, if it's within my power, I, I'm going to try to help you. And it is within his power. He just does not have 
the wisdom or the experience in doing this sort sort of thing. I this may be his first time having to have this talk with someone, so maybe we can give him the benefit of the doubt, but still he's an adult, he's an old man. Perhaps he doesn't have children. Perhaps he hasn't had this kind of opportunity to be a mentor for another student. And so Holden is becoming the guinea pig and <laughs> the experiment is failing because he could have he could have done, well, I guess Google wasn't there, but he could have went to the library and, or asked around and so, and asked for some advice. Perhaps that is why he was trying to pull from Mr. Thurmer's example and Holden's parents, because then he could gain some kind of clarity and figure out, okay, what's my proper mode of action here? He doesn't talk about anecdotes about his own life. He doesn't have ways for Holden to, you know, get on track or, if you were in Mr. Spencer's shoes, what would you have done? Ask yourself that. Even he could have, you know, painted a beautiful image of a future that Holden wants and then showed him the path of how to get there and, and then sh explained to him the path that he's currently on is not leading to this beautiful future that he wants, but let's, let's move you there. You have time, you're only 16. But in the previous lecture, he is saying that Holden will learn when it's too late. So he already, he's not telling Holden that you can change. He's saying, no, you're not gonna change. Your, your life has already ruined, though he's 16. Next passage. He, he really was too, he could see that. But it was just that we were too much on opposite sides of the pole, that's all. I know you are, sir, I said. Thanks a lot, no kidding, I appreciate it. I really do. Once again, I think we see Holden's, he has this, <laughs> He's very compassionate and he's empathizing with Mr. Spencer quite a bit throughout this passage. If, you, if you're curious, look into the, the previous lectures because I pointed out, but here we see that Holden understands, he can empathize, he can, he can see that there's a part of Mr. Spencer that is trying to help. There's some good intent behind his words and actions, though they're not the best and they're misguided and they're having a, a derogatory effect and they're being very, they're, they're detrimental to Holden, but I think he does realize that Mr. Spencer isn't the man to do this sort of mentoring, but he, there's a part of him that wants to be that person. He just doesn't know how, because he doesn't know himself. Mr. Spencer is not just, he's not a complete villain, though in this passage, he's becoming one. I think Leo Tolstoy does the best job in regards to authors who allow us to see characters for what they are and what most human beings are, which we're complex. We have negative and positive qualities, each and every one of us, and we're not all bad and we're not all good. And I don't think Mr. Spencer is just this horrendous monster, but he's not an innocent like old man or a wise old man either. And in this passage, he's, he's more so, we're seeing the, the worst qualities of him an insecure old man that has spite, possibly for himself and the world and now for Holden as well. There's just a lot of contempt and perhaps because his life didn't turn out the way he wanted, he feels disrespected by this youth and he wants him to feel the same amount of pain that Mr. Spencer feels every day. In regards to Mr. Spencer thinking he's really helping, there's this trickster archetype that's in many myths and various cultures, but I think it, it plays a role in the way we ignore or perceive our intentions and ignore our shadow and perceive what our intentions are. The trickster is really great at this. They show you one side, they get you to focus on one, right? A lot of the times you see tricksters and they'll be painted like in black and white checkerboards because it's like the dark and light or they have like mirrors and reflections. It's always trying to alter your perceptions and allow you to focus only on one thing. It may be like the illusionist who has, you know, the clock and you're paying attention and you're not seeing everything around you. It's not giving you the entire picture. And so we become blinded. Part of us is, a lot of it is willfully being blind, but perhaps we just, like here, I think when someone has never reflected on themselves, it's almost like a lost cause with Mr. Spencer, unfortunately. And 
what's difficult too is when you start becoming very blind to yourself, you you rational you can rationalize any irrational action. The more intelligent you are, the more adept you are at rationalizing the most irrational actions. And we're always find that you can always find a rationalization for why you do something, no matter what. And therefore, you can, Mr. Spencer, he can find rationalizations for the way he handled this, right? This is, I'm sure you can think of some for Mr. Spencer. Maybe he could be just thinking, well, I needed to be stern with him. I needed to do this because he has to learn. If I'm not stern with him, then who will be and who won't be on the right path? He had to hear his essay, whatever his, whatever his rationalizations are. And I think Mr. Spencer, he, I mean, he has to repeat himself. He repeats himself twice previously about helping him, right? So he's asking if Holden blames them and asks Holden what he would do in the situation earlier on, if you remember. So he's trying to help him. He's trying to put sense into his head. He's trying to ensure that he did the right thing, that he wants to make sure that Holden is not blaming him, though Holden kind of hates him, he says, and he doesn't think he could forgive him. But he's not going to tell Mr. Spencer that. He doesn't want to hurt his feelings, which he mentions a lot throughout this chapter, that he is concerned about Mr. Spencer's feelings, but it doesn't seem like Mr. Spencer is concerned for Holden's feelings. But I think Mr. Spencer is desperately trying to ensure in his own psyche and ego that he's doing the right thing by doing this. Because he keeps trying to find the clarification. He's trying, he wants to know what Holden will do. Like, do you blame me if you're in my shoes? Do you blame me for flunking you? Would you do the same exact thing? Tell the truth. I'm trying to put sense in you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. And I think one of the reasons for that is he's uncertain for sure. He doesn't know if he's doing the right thing. And he's trying to free himself from any guilt from doing the wrong actions. He doesn't want to feel remorse. Perhaps he is worried about damaging Holden further, but he just doesn't know what's the right proper course of action. And he's just so out of touch. He's so uncertain with who he is that he isn't able to recognize what's true and what's false. And then this is, he doesn't want to feel guilty because it's tough. If you have doubt, right? You, if you start doubting what you did, guilt starts to build and that guilt becomes like a heavy sort of weight that acts as like a free fall where it drops into your stomach and you feel that conscience becomes extremely heavy. It feels like it's wearing like a weighted vest and you're, you're not able to settle down. You just keep thinking about it and replaying in your mind. Like, did I do the right thing? Did I do the right thing? I'm sure you've had moments like this when you start doubting what you did previously and you're not able to relax. That guilt does weigh heavy. <laughs> it does feel like that. And I mean, I think guilt may indeed be our most horrid of monsters. Wouldn't you agree? Because yeah, it, it gives you no peace of mind. And I also understand Holden's yielding and his acquiescence in the situation when he says the words, we were too much on opposite sides of the pole. Because there are times where you're engaged in an interaction with a person and one of you is trying to help out the other, but you're just too far apart to make any real change in the person, correct? It's as if you're speaking different languages and you're both just on these like different frequencies. Right? Everything is not clicking. When you're saying something they're not understanding, they may say something to you and you don't really quite understand. And the cliche, you're not on the same page. So yeah, you guys aren't understanding one another and it's tough. And though you may be appreciating what the other person's trying to do or vice versa, you understand that this is just not working, right? There's gonna be no communication here. It's frustrating, especially if you're on the helping side because you're trying to like explain things to a person, but they are just like allowing your words to be expressed, but not actually heard. To them, it's sound. To them, it is a sound that they don't resonate with. Therefore, they ignore what you're saying and just continue to vent and think the same way they were thinking before. You have probably dealt with this with a friend or a romantic partner or coworker, whomever, roommate, doesn't matter. 
where they vent to you and complain and they have it they have problems and they continue to tell you their problems and you give them advice you try to help them out you try to allow them to see things in a different light perhaps what they're complaining about isn't isn't correct perhaps they have something to do with it which is maybe the case and they aren't listening to you at all and so you start to get annoyed correct you're tired of them complaining to you because they're not they're not doing anything to change it they just love to vent they just want to have you to complain to and they're not listening to you they ask for your advice but they are just asking in order for to it's like it's like they want you just to talk about it and take interest in them as well, though they really don't care what you have to say. They're looking for you to confirm whatever they're saying, validate their anger, validate their their complaints. And if you if they have a plan of action of how they want to respond, they want you to confirm that and say, oh yeah, that's that's what you should do. And if you disagree with them or present another course of action, they would disagree. Or they may be polite and say, oh yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea. I may do that, but they won't do it. And then you just get, you get very frustrated with them and they cause such vexation that you just, you start to despise them and not even want to deal with them because you, you know what's going to happen. It's, it's programmable at this point. It's, it's automatic. So I think you may understand what he means like on different sides of the pole. Holden's understanding that he's made, he's trying to help, but the way he's doing it is not, is not a proper manner. They're, they're not even near the same. Like, it's the same frequency, not in the same locale at this point. And so Holden's best mode of action for him is just to, just to say that I know you are, and thanks a lot. Because trying to explain to him that it's not working will just it will open up just this new... It's not... The conversation won't be great. It, it will be pointless. It would just make a, a it would cause a mess and cause just perplexity for both parties, especially old Spencer. And so Holden understands that's not worth it. And he may at this point just want to leave. So why drag this on? And you, you may have this wisdom like Holden at certain times in your life where a conversation is just not worth it. There's no point. It's better just to walk away and give the person what they want and just say, yeah, yeah, I understand. And Holden's just trying to respond and by telling Mr. Spencer what he wants to hear because that's what Mr. Spencer yearns for. People want their, people want others to confirm and validate their own thoughts, beliefs, and complaints. Simple as that. And if Holden disagreed about him not really trying to help him, he could say, you're not trying to help me because he doesn't seem like he is. And he could explain, he knows it's not going to work. And once I can mention, you probably had conversations or even arguments that turn it, or maybe they start as conversations, they turn into arguments. And this is very apparent in any kind of political debates, correct? That that gets very touchy and both sides refuse to listen to one another. They, can, they can't be open. They don't want to even listen to what the other individual has to say. They're both just trying to push their ideas onto the other. And that never works. That's... Like the number one thing about persuasion is to never try to force your ideas on people because they're not going to accept them. You have to have them come to their own ideas from like presenting information. But yeah, you it's it's bad. I think because people are insecure about their own ideas and their their beliefs and the foundation they're standing on and they refuse to to open themselves up to hear new things and present new evidence because that new evidence may knock over their foundation. That's so weak for them, unfortunately. And then they do not want to descend into chaos. So they'd rather just build a wall around themselves and stand firm on a foundation that they themselves know isn't too great, isn't too sturdy. And it's unfortunate because the mature thing would be for one to, to always adapt, to always be open to new information and they would be so attached to an idea. We tend to think our ideas, our beliefs, that they're us, correct? So if someone says they're wrong, then it feels like they're saying we're wrong. It, it feels like they're not validating our existence. And people get way too attached to ideas. You can discard them and then pick up new ideas when new information is presented to you. That should be the mature thing to do. But many individuals do not do that. 
it's even bad. It's in the scientific world, the intellectual world. There's numerous examples. As a, I don't want to go on a tangent, but I'm sure you can look into it or have heard about it as well. And those have a lot to do with egos as well. But it just, yeah, it throws you into chaos. You feel like you, there's almost an embarrassment for a lot of people too. Like they don't want, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed. They have too much pride to admit that they were wrong, especially if they're very fervent in their beliefs and ideas and they're pushing it and always saying it and proclaiming it, posting it everywhere, like on social media or telling everyone. And then they figure out, oh man, I was wrong. They don't want to admit that. So they, they like, they plant their, <laughs> they really dig in their heels, right? Do some squats and get low and chain themselves to that, that foundation. And even though they know it's wrong, they're gonna go down with it. It's sinking, but they're saying, I'm going to go down. I refused to admit I was wrong, which is just foolish, childish. Then we see Holden confirming Mr. Spencer, his words once again. He's saying he's helping him. Holden says, I know you are. Though, I think Holden understands he's not helping him, but he doesn't want to say it. Just like how he's been doing that. He's been lying to Mr. Spencer throughout this whole interaction. And it's up to you to think if he's doing the right thing or wrong thing. It's difficult to say, correct? Interactions like this are tricky, very tricky. Is he really doing him a favor by lying to him? And Mr. Spencer is clearly not doing Holden any favors. And then he wants to show his appreciation for it though we know this is a lie as well. And it seems that way because look at how how much Holden is trying to convince Mr. Spencer. He's saying, thanks a lot. No kidding, I appreciate it, I really do. Four separate ph for phrases, it's all separated by periods, by the way. Thanks a lot, no kidding, I appreciate it, I really do. Mr. Spencer probably doesn't. He, he may know in himself that what he's doing is wrong, but he doesn't want to admit it but he can feel it. And Holden is trying to calm his nerves. He's trying to give him that relief, free him from the guilt, give him what he wants and convince him like, oh no, no, I really do appreciate what you're doing. I do, I do, I do. I know I've been, done that before. I'm sure you have as well, where you're trying to calm someone down. And though it's not really the truth and it's obvious to both parties, though you're saying the things that they wanna hear, there's something underlying the words that both of you understand, and it's it's odd that that that, that works. There's an intuition. There's there's, there's, just, there's just a feeling in the air that you know that something isn't right. Though this person's telling me they appreciate it, uh, it doesn't seem like they do appreciate it. Though I'm saying I I'm trying to help them, it doesn't feel like I'm really helping them. Why? And then Mr. Spencer, I I think will never look back and reflect on himself. He may, he may just put all the blame onto Holden. It seems like that's his character and a character flaw of believing that the only reason he's not getting through with him, the reason why he feels so bad is because he feels like Holden isn't being open to him and not allowing him to help him out. Because he's really emphasizing he's trying to help them. He's trying to help them, right? If I can, like, if you allow me to help you, then I can help you, but you're not allowing me. And he feels like Holden isn't getting it. He's trying to put sense in his head. He doesn't feel like Holden has concerns for his future and all this. All right, back to the book. I got up from the bed then. Boy, I couldn't have sat there another 10 minutes to save my life. The thing is though, I have to get going now. I have quite a bit of equipment at the gym I have to get to take home with me. I really do. So Holden's clearly looking for an excuse to leave and then tries to convince Mr. Spencer that what he's saying is true because he says, I really do at the end of it. Once again, trying to convince Mr. Spencer like he did in the previous passage, because his word isn't good enough, especially with Mr. Spencer here. And the reason it may not be good enough is because he's been lying to Mr. Spencer constantly. So if he was honest with him, then he wouldn't have to try to double down and try to convince him that he's telling the truth. And this, I think, happens with many of us. If we are honest with someone, whether it be, you know, someone who's close to us, we don't feel the need to explain ourselves because we understand that that person knows when we're telling the truth. They're not going to question us. They're, they're going to accept a word. We don't, have to, we don't have to do all this extra fluff. I do want to point out another hyperbole, just so you're aware. 
Holden speaks to them quite frequently. I haven't been pointing them out, but just look out for them. He says, I couldn't have sat there another 10 minutes to save my life. Right, a hyperbole. If he really had to save his life, he probably would have sat there for 10 minutes. I think Holden's once again showing why how he participates in the phony world in regards to his ex excuse here. Because he wants to leave, but he doesn't know how to be honest. So I'm sure you have done this many times if you can think back in your life. I know I have. When you want to leave, but you don't want to be honest because it's going to hurt the person's feelings, right? Or they're going to try to convince you to stay. You, you don't want to just say, hey, I, I want to leave. <laughs> Hey, I just don't want to be here anymore. It just seems rude. So you have to always think of a, an excuse. And a lot of the times before I go out to certain places, I have an excuse, which is unfortunate. But that's like something that you start developing, correct? Especially if you're, let's say, with uh, if you're married or have a partner and you two are going out to a party or a dinner party or whatever, it may be a work event. You have certain things that you guys both agree if, if you guys want to leave, you're going to have this excuse. Many people who have kids use that as an excuse. Like, hey, we got to go relieve the babysitter. We said we'd be back by blah, blah, blah time. And so here he's like, oh, I have quite a bit of equipment at the gym. I have to get to take home with me. I really do. And the best excuses, right, are the ones where you have to, you've stayed long enough for one. You have to stay long enough where you think like, okay, an hour is good. I can leave now. And then you have an excuse that has a time constraint. So that way they can't say, oh, why don't you just do it later? Why do you have to do it now? So those always, the, for those who want an excuse, you probably shouldn't do it. But once again, we understand we kind of have to because how is someone going to take it if you say, hey, I'm actually just not enjoying myself. I'm, I want to leave. Someone may be uh, appreciative. If that's your character, then it's then you can get away with it. That's one of the good things about telling the truth is that People just kind of accept it if you're just straight up honest with them. I've always had an issue with just never wanting to disappoint people. So I was always making excuses or doing the, the worst thing, which is you keep putting it off. Like someone invites you and you say, oh, uh, who's going? Okay, well, uh, yeah, maybe uh, I'll let you know, right? That kind of thing. And then you try to make an excuse last minute instead of just saying, no, I'm not interested, which would say would have saved you all that trouble and you wouldn't have been like stressing out anything's just but think about your own excuses or excuses people have used to get out of a party maybe you invited people over and you have guests that come and then they want to leave what excuse do they use and the thing about it too that's interesting is you know that they know that you're lying to them and vice versa correct but you don't call them out and they don't call you out they don't say no you don't you're lying to me you just don't want to be here I don't think I've ever had that happen. I wonder if you have. Or actually, if they do call you out, you say, no, no, I'm, I'm being serious. And they say, huh, I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I've had that happen, actually. Or I've done that to people. And then they, I say, no, no, I understand. You have to leave. Or someone just makes it even more funny by saying like, no, no, you just, you're just not having fun. That's okay. And then you just feel like, okay, this is starting to get awkward. If you have if you have had any examples like that, I'd be I would be very curious to know. So back to the book. He looked up at me and started nodding again with this very serious look on his face. I felt sorry as hell for him all of a sudden, but I just couldn't hang around there any longer. The way he kept miss, missing the bed whenever he chucked something at it, and his sad old bathrobe with his chest showing, and that gripey sm smell of Vic's snows drops all over the place. So a question for you, why do you think Mr. Spencer has a countenance that evokes pity? Everything about him just evokes just sympathy, pity. Just, I understand why Holden kind of feels sorry for him, which is crazy too, that Holden is feeling sorry for him. He's the one that's flunking. Shouldn't it be the opposite way? I think it's an indication on the kind of man Mr. Spencer is. Where a teenager who's flunking out of school is feeling immense pity for him and even feels sorry, not maybe even, well, he feels sorry for him and he probably feels sorry and guilty for leaving him, correct? And perhaps Mr. Spencer was hoping for something better, but maybe also he is sad that Holden's leaving because he felt a value and importance in this situation, in this exchange. He felt like this was an opportunity for him to have some value, for him to have a purpose, to help this kid out. And then seeing that he 
knowing that he didn't get through to him because his methods were terrible, he is probably feeling even worse about himself. What do you think? I really do think he, he, he had these ex expectations. He had all this planned out because he sent him a letter, right? He knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to try to put Holden on the right track. And this often happens with, with individuals is they, they have these ex expectations, these hopes, these intentions for how they want something to go, whether it be a date, right? Or any sort of interaction or something like this. A game, if you're playing sports and you're painting this image in your head, you're having all this, these sequences, this, this fantasy of how it's going to work. And then reality comes and it's nothing like your expectations and you feel really depressed about it. You feel quite upset, more melancholy perhaps. And I think we see it here with Mr. Spencer. I do believe in his head, he thought he was going to do this grand gesture, get through to the kid, you know, he's going to be that, that amazing mentor that Holden looks up to, truly appreciates and says like, yes, Mr. Spencer, you put me on the right track. I'm gonna get my life together. Thank you for this. This meant the world to me, something of that nature. And instead it's just this kind of negative falseness and this negative energy is floating in the air. It's lingering. Everyone feels it. It produces this kind of awkwardness. And we see the scene here, the very serious look on his face, right? Holden, it, his, the look on his face evoked pity out of Holden. Holden saw him and was instantly felt sorry for him a visceral effect. So that's what I mean by why do you think he had that countenance, that facial expression that evoked so much pity, which pity is all, pity is, is a, it's like impulsive. We don't think about it. We don't think like, oh, I should feel sorry for this person. But you see certain people sometimes when you're around them or if you're walking by an individual and, and there's like a homeless person on the street and you see them and there's this like pity is instantly becomes evoked out of you. You can't control it. And I think that's why he says here, Holden, that he felt sorry for him all of a sudden when he looked at him. He, Mr. Spencer looks at him, starts nodding the serious look, probably defeated, melancholy, and Holden sees him and pity is instantly evoked. I mean, you can just feel that sad energy, you see the sad man and everything that's just lingering in that air. Imagine this scene, right, that just has been described. A cramped, dirty room, smells like sickness with Vic's nose drops. It's not pleasant. Seems qu probably quiet, correct, but a dreaded sort of quiet, not a peaceful quiet. Like that awkward, uncomfortable, there's tension in the air. You, there's discomfort and there's anxious feelings and no one can truly get comfortable, right? You look around and you see this old beaten down man who's sad and then a, perhaps a beaten down kid as well in Holden. But I think he does unfortunately have a right to feel sorry for Mr. Spencer. It seems that Mr. Spencer just is very sad and pathetic character. What do you think? He's old and sick, has issues with his wife. His life doesn't seem that great. And then this one shot he had, at least for him, where he could have done something that he was proud of, he fails at. He can't do any task, if you remember. He can't toss a magazine or exam paper on a bed that's two inches away. He can't pick up a chalk, a piece of chalk that falls on the floor. And he can't properly, he can't give a lecture. He can't teach in a course and make it interesting. And then he can't mentor a kid that needs help. So he's just, for Mr. Spencer, he just seems like he's a failure and has got to the end of his life and continues to fail and hasn't learned. And there's no, it's no wonder that Holden feels pity for him and feels sorry for him. I kind of do too, what about you? I also think this, a sight of Mr. Spencer could be used as good or bad because it could be Holden's future looking ahead of him if he doesn't change his path. He could end up like Mr. Spencer. And that thought has to depress you, if not frighten you. And perhaps that's another reason why Holden wants to leave, correct? And if Mr. Spencer had just even a small inkling about who he was, if he decided to have even just a weekend of introspection, he could have pulled out many examples of his own life and really helped out Holden use the the idea of like hey you don't want to end up like me these are the things i did 
you could change. You have your whole life ahead of you. He could have still put him on the right path in that manner. If he, if he, Mr. Spencer doesn't seem like an individual who can inspire him. Like, hey, if you keep doing this, you can end up like me, right? Because I would be like, oh no, I don't want to do that. But he could use his own life in a way that scares Holden into being on the right path. I also want to point out that Holden is now feeling guilty for leaving Mr. Spencer. It seems apparent that he is. He's making an excuse, he's lying, and perhaps now that he's seeing that Mr. Spencer has this very serious look because Holden's telling him he has to leave, he feels sorry about that. He's looking at him, he feels pity for this man, and he's like, crap, I, I don't want to be here, but I feel so sorry for this person. You may have had that conflicting uh, dilemma and that debate within yourself, and you're trying to find reasons to justify your departure, which Holden's doing here if you, if you read into it, right? He felt sorry for him, but he says, but I just couldn't hang around there any longer. The way he kept missing the bed whenever he chucked something at it, his sad old bathrobe with his chest showing and that grippy smell of Vic's nose drops all over the place. So if you've ever had, we've all had this, right? You have, you have what you desire to do. You know what you want to do. It may start bringing up feelings of guilt and you don't know if it's right, you're doubting it. And then you search for reasons to validate your choice, your desire. He wants to leave, so he's going to find reasons for why. He's going to find reasons for why he should leave and why it's fine that he wants to leave. It's justifying him. It's trying to relieve that guilt that he's going to feel later on because he is probably going to head back to his room and on that walk home, he's going to be thinking about Mr. Spencer and he may be debating with himself, thinking like, should I, should I have left him? Was that the right thing to do? And it just seems that both parties are going to to leave one another feeling worse, correct? The interaction wasn't great. And it, if you can think of examples in your own life in which the communication failed, though on all appearances and fronts, you both played your part to make it seem like it was great, that it went just as planned, but both of you know that it didn't. It leaves this nasty feeling with you. It really feels like you just have like this filth covering you and you can't wash it off and you're, and you're just, your conscience just feels, like I said, it's unsettling. The guilt begins to seep into your psyche and poison you in a way until you start to feel like this bitterness and it, it turns like acidic and you can't ignore it, it can't settle. And I think they're both going to feel that, what do you think? Perhaps Holden, Holden shows empathy to Mr. Spencer throughout this, but is that too much to expect from Holden as a kid to be the adult and care for Mr. Spencer? Because he's feeling sorry for him. It seems as if he's thinking about Mr. Spencer's feelings, Mr. Spencer's feelings far more than Mr. Spencer thought about Holden. He was deploying far more tact, though he was lying. Perhaps the responsible and right thing to do for Holden would be to spend time with Mr. Spencer and try to distract him, maybe, you know, play some cards with him and just talk, try to cheer him up, give him some company instead of leaving him to just lie in his bed or sit on his chair and wrapped in an old blanket and just be sick and by himself in his room because that's where he found him. He wasn't talking to his wife. He wasn't really doing anything. It was more as if he was just sitting there waiting to die. It's quite sad and it you know, a depressing scene. It's no wonder that he wanted to release this, this spite on Holden, hoping to make him as miserable as he is. Let us continue with the book. Look, sir, don't worry about me, I said. I mean it, it'll be all right. I'm just going through a phase right now. Everybody goes through phases and all, don't they? I don't know, boy, I don't know. So Holden tells Mr. Spencer not to worry about him, but if it's Mr. Spencer who's in need of someone to worry about him, correct? It seems that Mr. Spencer truly needs someone to worry about him. Holden, no. And Holden does a great job of, you know, stroking Mr. Spencer's ego once again, giving him the virtuous position of Mr. Spencer trying to help and doing everything he can to help Holden, reassuring him that he doesn't have to worry about him. But Mr. Spencer hasn't been helpful, correct? And he may not even truly care about Holden's well-being. 
Holden even gives Mr. Spencer like an alley-oop pass here, practically giving him the ideal opportunity to talk about phases in his life and how he got past them. Because if you listen to what Holden says here, right? Don't worry about me, blah, blah, blah. I mean it, I'll be all right. I'm just going through a phase, right? Everybody goes through phases and all, don't they? Mr. Spencer could say, yes, we do. I remember my phases when I was a teen, when I was your age, when I was in, my, in my 20s. This is blah, blah, blah. This happened, this happened. And this is what happened to me. It led me to here and it was a wrong choice. And this is why it was a wrong choice. This is what I should have done. Doesn't do any of that. Just says, I don't know. I don't know. Which is a proper response from Mr. Spencer, a man who doesn't know anything, who is uncertain, who has never grown. He has acquired zero wisdom and look at where it has left him. In a room, a cramped room, to himself, sick, wearing an old bathrobe, wrapped in an old, dirty, like beat up blanket, by himself, with no one else around. He didn't know where he was heading. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know who he was. And look at where it led him. He could have used all those examples, used fear as a great motivator. Sometimes fear is the best motivator than inspiration. You can inspire people, right? Some individuals can rock, watch Gary Vee videos, right? Or The Rock or Kevin Hart, or look at individuals who have money and success. And someone could say, you can get like me this day if you go out and do this and this and this. And people may just get that dopamine rush and then go back on to the computer and say, oh, Netflix series, whatever it may be. Then there's the other ones where it's more of a fear, correct? That works sometimes far greater for many individuals because life is too comforting for many of us. So instead, he could use fear. Like, if you don't change, you're gonna end up on this path. It's the idea of the, the quest to go after a treasure. Perhaps you see success, which has like gold. And if you're a man, you see this beautiful woman at the end of it, the princess right in the castle, but you have to take the journey. You have to fight some dragons along the way and defeat them. It's going to be an arduous task, but it's worth it if you really want that. And someone may dream about that and say, that's really amazing, I want that. And they see someone else who did it and they say, that's amazing, how did you do it? The guy tells them and says, you just got to do this, believe in blah, blah, blah. I use this sword, it's gonna work. Someone says, great, they take a few steps and then they say, uh, I actually don't really care that much. Like my life back home is pretty good. Do I really need a, a princess? Do I need more gold? I don't think so. And they go back. But then it's different if the fear is a dragon's coming from behind you and chasing you. And it's like, hey, if you don't move and start going towards that goal, the dragon's going to eat you. You're going to dissipate and perish and die. And the same idea is in life. Like if you don't start getting into action, then it's going to be devastating. That dragon is going to capture you. and You're going to be finished. I don't think it's that far-fetched for me to assume that there is someone that you know in your life whom you can look at as an example of what you don't want to become. I know a couple individuals that I've seen and it frightens me in the best of ways because I think if I don't get my act together, if I don't actually have an aim and continue to be aimless and childish, what is going to occur is I'm going to end up like that individual and that is a scary sight. I do not want to be that person, right? You know these people that that evoke what Mr. Spencer has. It evokes instant pity for you. You feel sorry for them, but you can't even think about their lives because you start to feel sorry for them. They're just like these pathetic people in a way. It's, I know it sounds terrible, but you, you feel that way about them and you're like, wow, I don't want to be that person. And you know that they could do something different. It's not like they even have hard times on them. They just chose to remain childish and never do anything with their lives. And no one is, wants to be around that person. No one feels, admires that individual. No one wants to be with that person. And they end up alone like Mr. Spencer and haven't ever learned. And that's such a depressing sight and it's terrifying. It's absolutely harrowing. Use those individuals to push you. I know I have been doing that more so as I'm starting to get older because I tend to have, uh, I'm apt to laziness like many of us, correct? I may get inspired for about a week, like by the inspiration, and then it, it dissipates rather quickly. And therefore the fear doesn't dissipate. I continue to look at that and say, oh man, I don't wanna be that. So let me continue on the right path and continue to move forward. Otherwise I'm just prone to indolence, perhaps like you as well.
what motivates you and use that motivation every day. Or when those days you feel like you don't have any motivation, you're lazy, either reach for those people that do inspire the typical like Will Smith or Gary Vee, right? The Rock, et cetera, whoever your person is. Or Jordan Peterson, right? <laughs> or he's a different one, he's like an in-between one. Or you find someone that you don't want to become and use that as fear and as a motivator. And lastly, just to touch upon this before I move on, how I mentioned that Mr. Spencer doesn't know anything and he doesn't even know about the phases in his life because I don't think he even went through phases in his life in regards to transformation, psychological phases. He's still stuck in adolescence. He's still stuck as a child. So therefore he never went through the proper phases of growth, of psychological growth and maturity. Therefore he has no phases to even pull from. Everybody goes through phases, right? I don't know. He doesn't know because one, he never even knew what phase he was in and he doesn't know what phase he's in now and he never even transformed. You only know that you went through phases when you transformed into a new phase, correct? Because you move past it, you look back at your life and you say, oh man, I was so childish then. I can't believe I used to think that. I was very immature. And we do that constantly. Think about the individual you were just even a year ago, but especially as you, the farther you get away and you look back to who you were as a child or a teenager or in college or your early 20s, depending on how old you are. And each time, if you made the proper psychological growth, the way you thought, the way you acted, the beliefs, your goals, what you desired, they differ and you realize that you're in a different mindset at a different phase in your life. And it's truly, this truly is a great, um, it, it elucidates Mr. Spencer in regards to his character. It's, it sums it up perfectly, right? He's a man that doesn't know. He's clueless, not the wise old man. All right, back to the book. I hate it when somebody answers that way. Sure, sure they do, I said. I mean it, sir. Please don't worry about me. I sort of put my hand on his shoulder. Okay, I said. Wouldn't you like a cup of hot chocolate before you go? Mrs. Spencer would be. I would, I really would. But the thing is, I have to get going. I have to go right to the gym. Thanks though. Thanks a lot, sir. So Holden seems unsure. He's saying, sure, sure they do. I mean it. And then when he's saying, I would, I really would, he's trying to convince Mr. Spencer to see things in the manner that Holden sees them. He's trying to explain to Mr. Spencer that people do go through phases, correct? And then he's lying to him about having to leave. I really would like to have a hot chocolate, which he wouldn't. He says, I would, I really would. We'd all do this, correct? Like, oh, I would love to, but you know, the thing is I have to get going. It's the polite thing to say. It's showing that you appreciate it. You really don't want to do it. You would make time for it if you did really want to do it, which we all do. It's, it's a rare circumstance when you really can't stay for something. The vast majority of the time we can make time for those, those events. Like if he actually was having a great time and enjoying his conversation with Mr. Spencer, he would love a hot chocolate and stay longer, but it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, he doesn't want to be there. He'll say the polite thing that he would be think he's thankful for him, he would love to have hot chocolate, but he can't because he has to go immediately now, the time constraint excuse, correct? Another interesting note is, look at how Holden is ha and handling this and Mr. Spencer. It feels as if the roles have been reversed, correct? It feels as if Mr. Spencer is now the child and Holden is the adult trying to comfort him, nurture him, right? He puts his hand on his shoulder and says like, okay, like, don't worry about me. It's going to be all right. And Mr. Spencer's like being down like, okay, are you sure? Can she stay? Wouldn't you like to stay? And he's becoming like this kind of pouty kid who's in this morose state, doesn't want the, the adult to leave, which the adult in this now is holding. The roles have kind of shifted. Holden went as like the kid, Mr. Spencer came as the the adult at first and then it quickly became apparent who was more of the adult in the situation which is Holden and I think that tends to happen correct if you are if you have friend, a friend group correct there's usually one friend who is who is the wild one right like everyone plays a role is what I'm trying to say and perhaps there's a role that you play maybe you're the parent of the, the friend group I know I've been that a couple of times where you naturally take on that role and because 
the situation calls for it, you begin to become more mature. Perhaps all your friends are just wilding out and acting like crazy fools. And if no one, if no one's being the adult, then you will all end up in prison, right? That kind of situation. So in in this certain in certain environments, depending on who we're around, we we change into certain roles. Perhaps we become more playful or more childish, or if we know that someone else is going to be the responsible person, we feel the right to be a little more childish, right? I, if we're going with this party analogy, perhaps you have a friend who is very responsible. They're not going to drink. They're going to be a, the DD. They're going to look after you. They're like, hey, uh, I'll, I'll make sure you guys stay out of trouble. And then you say, okay, that's my past to just be free. And you start just going crazy because you understand that this person you have trust in that individual, they're gonna be the adult in the situation and it calls for it. And depending on who we're around, we will take on different roles, different personas. And I believe that in this book here, Mr. Spencer clearly started taking on the role of a, a child. He was being very childish in all his antics and I think Holden picked that up. He wanted to encourage Mr. Spencer. He wanted to assist Mr. Spencer. If you remember, he's telling them that he's doing the right thing teaching's hard people don't know how hard it is don't worry like you're doing your best i know you're just trying to help etc etc here it is again like don't worry about me okay like don't worry everything's gonna be all right the world's reversed right it's interesting and when i mentioned about who you are and around certain individuals think about some of those examples in your own life the roles you, you the people you become the roles you take on depending on if the situation calls for it and who is who you're around and interacting with it's interesting that that happens i wonder if what you think do you think holden gained more certainty for this or more uncertainty i think he's he's still uncertain but i th i do believe that this interaction was important it feels as if like reading it again this time around it feels that holden actually gained more certainty from this interaction in a weird way it was a positive interaction because it seems to be as like as if holden was able to recognize that childhood nature and become more of a parent and he became certain about who he doesn't want to be and throughout this chapter we have we saw what well, we read holden mentioning to the readers about things he doesn't like so he started to become becoming more certain about who he is Though he may not know what he likes yet, he at least definitely knows certain things that he doesn't like, that he hates. And that is important to really forming a character about who you are. I mentioned this in previous lectures, but I'll mention it again. For many of us, it's easier to know what we don't like versus things we do like. And that's a good start. Also, it's clear to know that Mr. Spencer didn't want Holt to leave. Correct. He's offering him hot chocolate. He's trying to... He's also trying to push it on to Mrs. Spencer, which I think is another childish thing, correct? He doesn't say like, hey, I would love for you to stay. He says, wouldn't you like a cup of hot chocolate before you go? Mrs. Spencer would be, he gets cut off, but one can presume that he was going to say Mrs. Spencer would be glad to have you or glad to get us some. You may have seen this as well when someone doesn't want to admit something themselves because they feel, it's almost like a pride thing, right? They're, they're almost ashamed or embarrassed or feel it's it's weird that we can't be honest with that with one another a lot of the times mr spencer can't say like hey i, I want you to stay or can you stay for hot chocolate i'd love if you could have hot chocolate with me or stay a little longer but he's trying to push it off on somebody else like people do that with excuses all the time like oh i'd love to stay but you know i'm just gonna say a name you know julie she has to get back and study or you know i'd love to stay but you know it's just my friend he's just he doesn't feel well he ha we have to, I have to take him home that kind of stuff and here we have it. It happens in the other way too when you want someone to stay, but you don't want to say that it's you, you want it. And I don't know why. And I think it's a sign of immaturity, especially here with Mr. Spencer. And it's fitting for his character because it seems to be that everything about him is, is immature, it's insecure, and it's uncertain. Perhaps he doesn't even know that he wants Holden to stay. It may be the truth. He may not even realize that it's him that it wants Holden to stay. And he can't just straight up be direct and say, hey, Holden, I want you to stay. Because that thought isn't even apparent in his mind. It's a possibility. What do you think? Do you think Holden understands that Mr. Spencer wants him to stay? What do you think? He's, he says, I would, I really would. But the thing is, he makes that excuse that we mentioned. 
that he has to go. But do you think that he understands that Mr. Spencer wants him? Perhaps he does, but he's ignoring it because he's feeling sorry for him and he doesn't want he doesn't want to actually he doesn't want to stay. He wants to continue to use his his reasons for leaving, which were well, now he's trying to say that he has to leave. So he's trying to believe that lie, even though he knows it's a lie. But he also mentioned the environment, Mr. Spencer. He just couldn't stick around because it was making him feel like bad, right? Making him feel negative. He was seeing this just depressing image. And therefore, he doesn't want to open up the possibility of maybe I should stay because Mr. Spencer really wants me to stay. That might be the right thing to do. Perhaps. What do you think? And... Neither party is going to tell the truth. Mr. Spencer is not going to come out after this and say like, please, I really want you to stay. Can you just stay for 10 more minutes? Rarely that does that happen and it's quite sad. And mo both parties may know it, but they don't want to address it. And if they don't know it, that's, sometimes it doesn't, they don't know it, but that's miscommunication. People don't pick up on, you know, body language, tones. They want to just hear the, the words. I also think that Holden has to say that he wants to say, not only to be polite, but in order for Mr. Spencer to have an excuse and to kind of, relieve his own ego and if Mr. S Mrs. Spencer asks about it he has a reason and what I mean by this if you let me elaborate is Holden leaves Mrs. Spencer may come in and say hey where did Holden uh, where did Holden go why did he leave so soon and he could say well he wanted to save for small chocolate but he just had to go he had to go get some things from the gym correct and then that gives you both some relief it frees your it calms your ego it doesn't feel like it's it's wounding you wounding you it doesn't feel like that person just didn't want to be in your presence that they had a real excuse for why they had to leave and not be around you anymore correct you may know examples of this in your own life it helps mr spencer to know that and to believe that lie perhaps he knows the lie but he's going to believe it and force himself to believe it because the truth is way too hurtful, and which is Holden just didn't want to be around him any longer. He couldn't stand the sight of him. It was evoking too much pity, and he hated the way he was making him feel. And that's a depressing thing to admit to oneself. So instead, one will believe the lie and say he was just busy. He had to leave and pick up some gym equipment. And Holden is already indoctrinated into this phony form of communication, correct? This whole exchange since the beginning with Mrs. Spencer and through this whole exchange with Mr. Spencer, Holden has been lying nonstop. He's been doing the polite thing, the thing that one is supposed to do. He's participating in the phony society that he claims that he despises, yet he clearly participates and sees the usefulness of it. Or maybe he doesn't like it, but he's a hypocrite and he understands that it's useful Though he may not like it, he sees the use for it and he's going to use it, but then still say he hates it. And I think we all do this, correct? Think about your own life. How often do you deploy these same tactics? Though you may find them disgusting or you may dislike them immensely. And if you see them in other individuals, you hate it. You want to call it out. You say it's phony. It's fake. It's utterly repulsive. But then you do it. And perhaps you see it in yourself or perhaps you don't. A lot of the times people don't notice it in themselves. They're blind to their own hypocrisy. Maybe you just realize that you have to do certain things and you have to pretend in certain moments. You have to pretend to be phony. You have to tell people that you have an excuse for why you have to leave because it's too improper. Or you don't want to hurt these people's feelings. You put yourself in this virtuous position and make you validate all you, you justify all your actions, even though you know them to be wrong and know them to be fake. What is the same thing that Holden's doing here? He knows he's lying, he knows his actions are fake, but he's putting himself in a virtuous position. He's trying not to worry. Mr. Spencer, he doesn't want Mr. Spencer to feel bad. He continue, continually discusses Mr. Spencer's feelings, but never really his own feelings. He's doing everything for Mr. Spencer. He's putting him, he's making it seem like his actions are selfless, but they're selfish. Sure, there's a part of him that does feel like he's protecting him, which a lot of individuals do, they feel like they're telling lies to protect the other individual and not wanting to hurt their feelings, but they're also being selfish because they know the uncomfortable feeling that they will get and the possible confrontation that may occur and whatever else may happen if you're completely direct and honest with somebody, if he was really truthful for with Mr. Spencer this entire time. But then he knows that he lied, he, that guilt is going to weigh down on him. He, even though he may feel like he's protecting his feelings, he's still going to feel bad about it. And that's when you have to ask yourself, did I do the right thing? 
by lying? Did I really protect this person? Why do I still feel bad about lying, correct? Ask yourself those questions and perhaps you have to change that course of action. It's difficult, it's very difficult to shake out because it's going to be, it's going to cause tremendous discomfort when you first are honest with someone and direct because it's not, no one's used to that. If someone says, hey, I'm going to leave because I just don't want to stay any longer. I'm sure you could say it in a more tactful manner, but if you're being honest, it's, it's, it makes everyone feel better because it's not, it's not grimy. It's weird that it works. I was honest with a person once. I don't know if I mentioned this in previous lectures, but I was honest with a girl once and it made me feel far better with her and she respected it. There's a girl that I didn't like and I, I just told her straight up that I just was, didn't want to be dater. I just wanted to be friends. I know that sounds like it's something small, um, but it was still a weird thing because we went on a date and whatnot. And then afterwards I was like, hey, she wanted to hang out again. I was like, I like hanging out with you, but I, I want to make it clear. I don't want to lead you on, right? That I just want to be friends. And it seems something so small, but at that time in my life, that was very difficult for me to do. And it made everything better. It, it really, you know, I could go into the interaction seeing her again in an honest manner and not feel uncomfortable and not play with her emotions. And she didn't have to feel like, why is it nothing happening? I don't get it. And you guys are both just feeling a little uncomfortable. You don't want to make her laugh or make it seem as if you're into her, et cetera, et cetera. I think just honesty is the best policy, though it's hard at first. Like, false words give comforts to both parties. Let's be honest. It's comforting to both parties, but is it the right thing? Like I mentioned, Holden, feels comforted for his excuses. He has a valid excuse in his mind for leaving, even though he knows it's a lie, but he has other excuses that he's not gonna tell Mr. Sp Mr. Spencer about, about the room and all that. And those reasons are going, he's going to take with them and he's that's going to give him enough to move on and not feel that guilty. He's going to feel guilty and some remorse, but he can continue with his night. Mr. Spencer, can take some solace, a little solace in Holden's words, which I mentioned about the excuse that Holden gave him because it, he doesn't have to admit that Holden doesn't want to spend time with them. So both parties have these false words. It's polite, though both know it's a lie. Deep down, they both know it's a lie. A lot of the times they know it even consciously it's a lie, but they're, they'll take those words and it gives them some comfort because the truth can be hurtful. It'd be nice if the truth was pleasurable, but unfortunately it's not. It's often hurtful and harsh, but it, for the long run, it's better. Truth can be hurtful and menacing, but it would make life and human social interaction vastly more simple and easy if we all could just tell the truth. If we could be honest with one another, it'd be great. There's nothing more frustrating than, than, li than being a part of a lie, or if you're in a family that just lies to one another or friend a friend group or whatever it may be if you're at work and everyone just lies all the time and you have to keep all these lies and everyone's worried about hurting the other person's feelings and it just grows into this 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 elaborate scheme where you have to to remember all these details and you don't want to upset somebody for just telling some other individual the truth and you have to try to maintain all these lies and it's it's the most frustrating and infuriating thing and a part of you just wants to scream at everyone and say, why can't we grow up and be adults? Why can't we just tell the truth? Why is everyone so sensitive? This, this is not that big of a deal. Just tell the truth, handle it. What's interesting is it's quite the paradox in that the adult world is more imaginary and phony than, than childhood. You're a child and children are far more honest than adults, correct? We all know children just to sometimes be very direct Though they're inventing these world, worlds and being creative, they'll tell you the truth about things. And you, it may take you off guard, but you expect it. Because you're like, oh, it's a kid. They really don't really, they don't lie sometimes. They they're say harsh things. And you're like, shh, you're not supposed to say that. Correct? But then as, adult, we, as an adult, we understand that you're supposed to lie to people. You're supposed to not try to hurt people's feelings. You have to be overly polite, even if it's lying. And it's ridiculous. It's, it's frustrating, I think. And like I mentioned, it's just... It'd be so much better if we could just tell the truth to one another and people could not be so sensitive, could actually have, could be strong enough to handle just words and truth. People aren't strong enough to handle the truth. It's unfortunate, it really is. 
and like I mentioned, it's it's weird that you would think that we'd be we'd become even more honest as we as we age, but it's the opposite. And though the thing about it too is we will call adults vicious, right? Perhaps adult can be used as a term like bad or evil or rude, all these different things, uh, these negative terms that are used for adults. But then a child is typically never called these kind of things. You don't think a child's like evil. It's rare that someone will ever say that about a child. They're malicious, spiteful, vengeful. They're usually like loving, kind, right? joyous, any of these positive ones we usually associate with a, a child, though they're honest and may say something that seems harsh, because we know that's not coming from a bad place, they're just telling the truth. And somewhere along the line as we, we progress, we start, in a, in a weird way, we want to not hurt people's feelings by lying, and then it starts becoming, it gets like all muddled. And we start to have negative intentions. We know how to lie, we know how to hurt people, but we know that we shouldn't. I don't know, it's very difficult, right? You actually start to think about it. It's weird, and I wonder how that transition, or when it even begins. My assumption is as early as childhood, though. Once the child becomes, starts becoming more and more self-conscious, and they're told what, this, what they can say and what they can't say, because you'll see that, correct? A parent will tell their child, if they point something out and say something to somebody, they get embarrassed by it because they don't want to hurt that person's feelings. And they say, shh, you're not supposed to say that. And the person may say, no, it's okay, it's okay. Maybe their feelings were hurt, but yeah, it's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. And I think over time, you just become more and more indoctrinated, like Holden here. It just, without even realizing it, you're participating in the society that you claim that you dislike in this false, in this false world that we created of appearances, everything's appearance. And we care, we put so much emphasis on the appearance of it. Though behind it, behind the mask, behind the appearance, we, there's something else that's lying behind, beneath it that differs from the appearance. And we can recognize it, we may not point it out, but we know it's there, like here, in this excuse, in your own life, just use your own life. You understand that if the person's leaving your party makes up an excuse in the appearance of it, they're saying something, but you know behind it, that's not the real reason. You'll pretend and say, oh yeah, that's fine. Well, it's lovely to see you. But deep down, they know that you're kind of, you're upset with them that they're leaving and you may be a little hurt, but you're both pretending. And just as, as long as the appearance looks right, then both your part, the parties can leave. Though they're not gonna be satisfied, that's the thing you're supposed to do. And it is creating this false world. You're not breaking this world. You're not shattering this illusion. You're leaving it as is. And when you get leave this false world and get into the confines of your own private space in your room, perhaps even on, just on the drive home, sometimes when you just leave the door, someone you may start talking to the person that you're close with and say, say bad things about that person, right? Or when they close the door and those people leave, they may tell someone else and say like, oh, that was rude, they left, they make an excuse, they don't wanna be here, but they won't tell that individual. It's frustrating, it's very frustrating. It's quite nice to be around somebody who is just brutally, brutally honest. Maybe you are that individual. I'm not, unfortunately, but I know there's a, there's some people that you can definitely know. There's probably examples in your life. I know I've met many of them, those individuals who are just brutally honest. And though it, it has its trade-offs because it usually cuts people in half, right? It divides the individuals one side at, either loves that person and another side despises that person. They find them to be rude, brash, obscene. The other people find them to be refreshing. And no matter what, they're enthralling, they're captivating. They leave a mark. They have a personality, correct? They have an identity. Everyone remembers them, whether good or bad, at least they're memorable. And I find them to be very, very refreshing. I quite like them. It's it's enjoyable to be around them because you don't have to feel like you have to pretend. You don't have to worry about hurting hurting their feelings by saying something that's honest. You feel far, far more comfortable, and when you're around someone who's open and honest, then you can be open and honest. And it takes the tension down. You don't have to put on these airs, and everyone's just like fake giggling and like, oh yeah, ha ha ha, yeah yeah. I can't stand that, and I participate in it. And when I do, I feel terrible about it. I leave 
and go back to my room and just feel like, oh, I hated the way I handled that situation. And then I, I try to play it back in my head. I'm like, what did I do wrong? I'm like, I did all the things I'm supposed to do. I put on the appearance, but yet I feel horrible about it because it just all seemed fake and false. I know they were being phony to me and I was being phony to them. And perhaps if we were just, and it wasn't even like I didn't like them or they didn't like me. It's just like, it was all phoniness, correct? If you ever had this and you think, if only we had like a long form conversation, it was just me and that person or we, and we were just chilling and didn't have to be in this kind of professional setting. We would get along perfectly fine. But in this setting, we have to both pretend because we want to like, we want the other person to feel liked by us and to feel respected and vice versa. So we'll put on that, those airs, but yet it makes you feel, it gives you this negative feeling. It has the opposite effect, I think. It makes me think that the individual likes me less because I was phony to them. And it makes me feel like I may like them less because they're phony to me, even though they're trying to do it in a polite manner. It's weird, right? It would just be such a far less complicated world if we could just be truthful and honest. And I feel like it's it's becoming less and less that way in modern society. We're, we're way too concerned about hurting people's feelings that we're, we're, we're lying more and more. And you have to keep up with these lies and say the things that aren't supposed to be offensive, which is unfortunate, in my opinion. Let's get back to the book. Then we shook hands and all that crap. It made me feel sad as hell, though. I'll drop you a line, sir. Take care of your gripe now. Goodbye, boy. So we shake hands to maintain respect and the politeness, hence all that crap. That's what Holden says. He recognizes that. You're supposed to do those, the, the greeting, like, oh, yeah, it was nice to see you, the blah, blah, blah. You say all the right things. If there's a hug, that, then you hug that person. He says it made him feel sad, so the whole interaction was just extremely negative from the start, all the way to the finish, and both parties are leaving one, one another in at least they're leaving one another in worse positions currently, correct, in regards to the way they feel. But after reading this, I do believe that Holden is, a, is going to be able to derive some, some positive effects from this. He may, I think Holden developed a little bit here. Though he lied, though he had Mr. Spencer just kind of beat him down, it feels as if Holden matured he understood it. he gained empathy here. He became the nurturer, the parent, the parental role. It seemed like it, as if he took that on and he decided to take on the more mature role and not act like a child. Though he could have perhaps handled it differently, he may have understood that they're just far too different on different pages, like he mentioned, that he had to take on the, that polite and fake role. But what do you think? Also, Holden tells Mr. Spencer to take care. Of course, he's talking about his flu, but he's also saying to take care, which you would think would be completely opposite, correct? Because Holden was going to him because he was flunking out of school. And so you would think that Mr. Spencer would tell Holden to take care with his life. Once again, Holden is being the, the more mature individual, the nurturer, the parent. And I think it's hilarious that Mr. Spencer has to remind Holden that he's boy. Goodbye, boy. Because in his mind, he's still the man of the two situations, correct? He has to have that ego like, oh wait, I was I was the adult in this. I was the mentor in this. When it seems like it, it switched by the end of it, by the end of the interaction, Mr. Spencer was clearly the boy, but he's still in his own mind, in his own ego. And why he's the child and why he's a boy, he still has to call Holden a boy at the end of this. So back to the book. After I shut the door and started back to the living room, he yelled something at me, but I couldn't exactly hear him. I'm pretty sure he yelled good luck at me. I hope not. I hope to hell not. I never yell good luck at anybody. It sounds terrible when you think about it. So the typical conventionalities of shaking hands and, you know, thank you people for coming. And Mr. Spencer yelling good luck, maybe he remembered it and it sparked in his head and he probably felt like, oh, I didn't say good luck. It's as if you were walking out of a grocery shop, a grocery store, and you didn't say, have a good day, which, uh, which happens to, I don't know if you've ever had that occur where you buy, it happens more like at coffee shops where you get a coffee and you're walking out and an employee will see you walking out the door and they're screaming like, have a good day. And I think the same kind of idea, like, good luck. 
And good luck can be thought of as something as rather terrible to say to a person if you do think about it, right? It's one of those things we often say without thinking. There's a lot we say without thinking about it. Unless someone mentions it and then we're like, actually, yeah, why do, why do we say that? Good luck does sound bad. Like as if you really need, you need luck. And perhaps he really does feel like Holden needs it, but it, it seems like he's just saying it because that's what you tell people. Good luck. I do it sometimes and I, perhaps I will not do it anymore. When someone's about to, about to have, an, have some sort of venture where they're going to do whatever it may be, right? If they're, if they're an artist and they're having a show, if they have a big presentation or they're taking a test, you tell them good luck. It's coming from a good place, but why would they need luck? Holden claims he would never yell good luck at anybody, but I would say he should be wary of that. Because as we have seen throughout this passage, this chapter, Holden takes on all the conventionalities he he play he plays the phony part well he knows what to say and he does it even though he may not like it and i think he would be saying good luck to someone too is if he doesn't stop this if he continues to go down this path of being phony and participating in the phony world he's going to be the one to say good luck as well correct don't you agree i i really think he knows that the social that's the social norm and he's been performing those social norms thus far especially with the adults that he's interacting with. Therefore, I do believe he'll yell good luck at somebody if he doesn't prevent that. If, if, as we continue, and it doesn't seem like he's going to make that psychological leap into something greater, and he's just going to fall in and be willfully blind, he's going to yell good luck at someone. And just to mention this as well, I find myself in the hypocritical shoes quite often, and I've mentioned this already, and I'm sure you as do as well. I criticize, you know, the banalities of life, the, the phoniness, etc. but then I participate it. I do the things, and at times I like it. I even, I even find it, you know, you find it quite repugnant if someone doesn't do it at first. It throws you off and you feel like that individual is rude. If I go to another state or another country and they don't do the things, like if you go into a supermarket and they don't say, hey, how are you, when you're checking out, right? How's your day? I have to start saying it. And I'm like, why aren't you saying this to me? Usually people are kind, but it's just, I make fun of it. But yet, if it doesn't happen, it it makes me, it gives me this impression that the person's rude, that they don't have polite manners. I don't know if you deal with a similar certain a uh, similar situation if that occurs in your life or has occurred. A question I want to pose to you, which afflicts Holden throughout the book, is how does one stay true to themselves in a world that's phony? But what I want individuals to understand is in order to first try to stay true to yourself, you have to know who you are. How do you stay true to yourself if you don't even know who you are? You must know thyself first, and then you can stay true to yourself. Then you have to worry about that problem. But you can't just start asking how to stay true in a world that's phony if you don't even know who you are, because what's true to you. So first discover that. And I think Holden needs to discover that because clearly he's a teen and like many teens, and like many of us, even when we're not teens, we're uncertain about who we are. We have, and Holden's clearly uncertain, it's obvious. Therefore he has to figure out who he is first before he can even remain true to himself. But I'll leave it that to you. Who are you? And if you do figure out who you are, how do you possibly stay true to yourself in a world that we mentioned, this adult world, which is more phony and imaginative than the child world? So that's the end of chapter two. We finished, but I'm just going to ask you a few questions to ponder and answer yourselves, including that one I just mentioned to you. Who are you? what is true to you, and how to stay true to yourself in a world that's phony. But here's some other questions I thought about for you all. To ponder, answer, feel free to send them to me if you want to give your answer to somebody. But if you just want to do it and keep it to yourself, that is great as well. So to the questions, can you recall a certain time you did something wrong and a parent or authority figure had a private conversation with you? What were you in trouble for? What did they say to you? How did they handle the situation? Did they reprimand you? Was it helpful? 
How did you feel during and after the conversation? And what were your thoughts and feelings towards them during and after the conversation? Did you feel more inclined to go to them in the future when another problem occurred or less likely? Do you have a favorite instructor slash teacher? Why were they your favorite? How did you do in their class? Was it a subject you were already interested in, in prior to taking their course? Did you find yourself more engaged with this course than any others? Did you look forward to attending this class? Were you more likely to take a similar course in the future because of this course? Have you ever treated someone differently because of their appearance, social status, title, etc.? How did you feel after the interaction? Why do you think you treated them differently? Did you ever do something that you thought you were doing for the right reasons and then it turned out that indeed you weren't? What was it? What did you think you were doing and what were you actually doing? How did you find out that your intentions were actually not what you thought they were? What was your intended result and what was the actual result of your actions? Lastly, is there a particular passage in this chapter that you completely related to or what captivated you greatest? If so, what was it and why? Thank you for listening. The next lecture, we will begin chapter three. Bye.